thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as you, this meeting will be recorded, so people who were, felt so bad about not being able to uh, come at this particular time tonight can access it at their leisure, and um, and I'm sure a lot of people will do that. The League of Women Voters has always been interested in water for a hundred years, hundred and two uh, years, and it started out mostly as uh, people being wanting good quality for children because that uh, the league originally when it got started had a lot of interest in making things good for children. About in 1966, uh, there was a group who at a National uh, League of Women Voters convention uh, brought up the proposition that there should be an interleague group that watched and watched Lake Michigan's quality and protect, work to protect it. And that got um, uh, passed. And so the ILO or interleague organization, the League of Women Voters of the Lake Michigan region got started to protect and preserve the waters of Lake Michigan. And they've been doing that for the last 50 years. Uh, tonight we are most fortunate to have with us the president of the uh, League of Women Voters of the Lake Michigan region, uh, Elizabeth Joy uh, Guscott Mueller. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's uh, a practicing attorney and managing partner of Guscott Mueller Law uh, in Chicago. And her firm's practice includes environmental, real estate and estate planning matters, as well as business transactions. She has served as an electoral college issues specialist for the League of Women Voters of Illinois, issues and advocacy committee, and currently serves as an electoral college committee member and the electoral college research subcommittee member. A member of the League of Women Voters of the US Climate Change Interest Group Steering Committee, Joy also serves as chair of the Climate Change Interest Group Water Subgroup. Past local league board work includes service as vice president of program and board secretary. As a member of the US District Court, Northern District of Illinois, Federal Tri -bar, Trial Bar, sorry, Joy volunteers on its pro bono panel representing indigent clients in employment discrimination and civil rights litigation. She is also a member of the City of Lake Forest Legal Committee. Past community involvement includes service as a Lake Forest Elementary School Board member and in leadership for many not-for-profit organizations. Joy holds a BA and JD degree from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Master's of Divinity from McCormick Theological Seminary in Hyde Park. So uh, please welcome Joy Guscott Mueller, uh, President of the League of Women Voters of the Lake Michigan Region. Well, thank you, Nancy, for that introduction. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing that with the group. And I just want to clarify, I've retired off the Electoral College um, uh, election of a spe issue specialist, but I still serve on the Electoral College Committee. And that's a lot of exciting work that's going on in that area. And if you were at convention, you, you heard about how that's a, a focus now uh, at the uh, LWVUS level. So, I am delighted to be here though today as president of League of Women Voters Lake Michigan region. And I was going to talk to you a lot about who we are and what we do, but Nancy's done such a terrific job of, on that that I'm not going to have to say much more, except that we are very excited uh, to be assisting people with educating and assisting leagues with educating people about Lake Michigan region and the great lakes as well as water issues um, and in the last year uh, we have tripled our educational initiatives having three major events uh, as including our series on state specific programming which focused on how climate change and PFAS and other issues are addressed in the various states and, and the impacts of those 
But tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the impact of climate change on water. And I'm going to share my screen. So if you'll bear with me while I make sure that we get a good picture for you folks. And you'll have to assist me and let me know. Are you able to see that in presentation mode? Not yet. Now we've got it. You'd have it. Wonderful. Okay. So as Nancy said, we are an interleague organization of the state and local leagues surrounding Lake Michigan. And so that is Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And right now we have 56 uh, member leagues and if you know folks from other leagues in the area please encourage them to join us in our efforts and to when Fran reached out to me she indicated that you all were really interested in hearing about climate change and the threats to water and so we are going to be talking about preserving and protecting great Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes and, you know, for climate change, it, it presents tremendous threats to water. And the assumption that water is both available and safe to drink may not be true in the future. And we really appreciate it, our resource, our precious resource of Lake Michigan. Uh, but I sit on the League of Women Voters Climate Interest Group Steering Committee and I chair its water committee, its water sub team. And we have folks from all over the country. And in some of those states, uh, people are really struggling because they don't have access to safe water. And it's really in jeopardy. So across the US in the various watersheds, we see a variety of impacts of climate change on water. So here, um, in the Great Lakes, I'm sure given where you folks are and we have a, we live in Illinois, but we have a lake house in Michigan. And we all know that we, we've seen hot, unprecedented high water levels and erosion in the Great Lakes. And it was a little better this year, but boy, that erosion, at least in the Holland and Saugatuck and Douglas area, is a little south of you folks, uh, the impacts were tremendous. Pardon me. And then, you know, there are rising sea levels in the oceans and resulting floods and saltwater intrusion in the coastal areas. And in our water sub team, um, we have folks from California and Washington and then folks from the East Coast and they they are experiencing a dramatic rise in sea levels and various impacts. We also were seeing growing intensity and frequency of severe weather events. For instance, there are heat waves and rainstorms and hurricanes. And again, depending on where you live, the impact of climate change on your water situation may vary. This is a slide <clears throat> that shows the impacts of climate change um, and how temperatures are continuing to rise. And Fran was making reference in our gathering time to our climate change forum, uh, which was an Earth Day kickoff that we held in April of 2021, earlier this year. Um, and yes, we were coming to the tail end, or not tail end, but sort of a a decrease in, in the levels of, of COVID danger, but uh, it was still pretty touch and go in April, but we had many, many people join. It was hybrid, but we had many, many people join us online as well. And it featured Tom Skilling, who is the meteorologist for WGN TV. And in our area and throughout, uh, especially Wisconsin and Indiana. Um, he is very popular. <coughs> and Tom has become a climate change um, activist. 
And he has brought together what we call a dream team of folks, uh, which includes Donald Wobbles from University of Illinois. Um, he is a climate scientist that was a co-lead author of the um, IPCC, International Climate uh, Change um, Report uh, that won a Nobel Prize. And um, Seth Darling from Argonne Labs. And so they gave us a terrific presentation on climate change and its impacts. And this is a slide Tom shared and it shows how temperatures continue to rise. And so uh, 2021 ties 2018 for the sixth warmest year on record. And this graph uh, demonstrates that uh, dramatically. So this is what I was referring to before, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, estimates that most climate change impacts will be connected to water in the coming years. They, they've indicated in this report that some of the impacts you will see are drought, floods, unreliable water supplies, and poor water quality. And of course, we recognize this as Lake Erie. And uh, this is a slide from NASA, and it shows the eutrophication uh, that's taking place there and ex exacerbated by the impact climate change. And then of course, ecosystem devastation. And again, we have more examples of climate change impacts and, and how they're disparate throughout the country. So there are climate change, climate related changes to what rainfall. So it causes drought and water scarcity in some areas, such as Utah and California and then flooding in others. And this persistent drought and lack of water, especially on the West Coast now, stresses trees and the increased temperatures exacerbate wildfires. And while too much um, rainfall in some region causes floods, it's made worse along the coast lines by the sea level rise. And that continues to push the water table higher. And again, this is another one of Tom's slides providing sat satellite data from 1993 to the present and, and identifying the rate of change at 3.3. Also, the problem with uh, ground, uh, the rise in groundwater is that it impacts septic systems and gas lines, building foundations and more. And so what you're seeing here is a septic system that's basically breached the land as a result of the groundwater uh, level rise and causes extensive damage. And then of course, the runoff from the fires and flooding can carry pollutants, debris, and contaminants into waterways, including drinking water sources. So let's talk a bit about climate change impacts on Lake Michigan. So we've noticed there are more extreme Lake Michigan water levels. And this high water level uh, increases, it, it couples with stronger winds and heavier storms. So there are because of the rising temperatures, um, you have more extreme weather events and you have turbulence in the water and excessive and extreme waves. Um, and that results in erosion, beach loss, damage to shoreline residential, commercial and industrial areas and presents risks to communities and Lake Michigan itself from shoreline sites with toxic materials. Now you folks up in your neck of the woods know that line five is an issue that's got many, many folks um, concerned. And here's the Mackinac Bridge. And uh, here is a, a photo um, that's labeled line five pipelines. And Oil and Water Don't Mix, which is a group that provides a lot of information to us and that we support and, and um, 
consider allies and, and partner with and for the love of water flow, they're identifying those line five pipelines. And I probably don't have to explain a lot to you folks because you probably, some of you probably may know more than I do about this. These pipelines um, are converge uh, between the two lakes and you've got those Straits of Nakana are very turbulent anyway. And the line five, uh, which, which uh, carries the oil, it, you know, it's old. That line is old and the infrastructure is degrading. And the concern of course, is that this tur turbulence is going to damage the infrastructure and result in a spill. Um, and so there's a lot of legal effort. Uh, the governor um, rescinded the easement, but that's presented jurisdictional problems. And so it really is, is caught up in the courts. And I think a lot of you probably know that um, Enbridge is proposing a tunnel underneath the lake as a substitute. Well, that presents a whole lot of other issues, but vis-a-vis -vis climate change, um, the increased and extreme weather events uh, present even more of a risk to not only Lake Michigan and you folks in Michigan, but the Great Lakes writ large. A report I would like to bring to your attention, which provides a lot of detail, but it's pretty easy to read and accessible, is has been created by another organization with whom we uh, collaborate. And it's called the Environmental Law and Policy Center, ELPC. And it is in um, located in Chicago, uh, but they have produced a examples of impact risks to Lake Michigan states in their report called Rising Waters. And I commend it to you for your, re your reading. And um, it, will give, it will provide you with actually photos, NASA photos that show uh, where some of these dangerous uh, sites are, where they have tremendous risk related to climate change. So let's talk about a few of those. Um, in, in Michigan, an example of the impact risks to Lake Michigan is in the city of South Haven, uh, the wastewater treatment plant. And that's south of you folks, and it's, it's just south of um, Saugatuck, Douglas, Holland area, probably about oh, 15, 20 miles south of Holland. And uh, there's a wastewater treatment plant there, and it's a low-lying area along the Black River, and flooding is common in there, in, in this region, and the partially treated wastewater has spilled multiple times in the past few years, uh, specifically October 2017, November 2019, and June 2021. And so what happens then is these overflows of the pollute, they pollute the river with sewage and biosolids and have for, forced beach closures throughout the area. And you probably know this already, but South Haven is a, is a resort yeah, and beautiful beaches. And apparently the June 2021 overflow was particularly severe and you had 100,000 uh, gallons of partially treated wastewater, which spilled after the heavy rains. And so they have made efforts to move to permanent anti-flooding measures in that area. And in February 2020, the public works officials requested 1.2 million in funding to approve the plant's pumps and prevent further sewage overflows. And then in May 2020, the city placed temporary flood barriers as a mitigating measure. So they're trying to improve the situation and uh, you know, address um, the impacts of climate change and these extreme weather events and wave action uh, and plan to construct permanent walls. Uh, however, it's still in the design phase and they are planning on allotting $20 million to protect the wastewater treatment plant and other shoreline infrastructure. 
I think it's important too for us to look at examples of impact risks in the neighboring states, even though um, it's not Michigan. It does impact Lake Michigan itself, uh, and it's and if it impacts Lake Michigan because they're all interconnected, it impacts the Great Lakes at large. So, at the state line coal plant in Hammond, Indiana, um, this is a former coal plant that's on the lake shore, and coal ash, which uh, is derived from the coal burning process, was dumped on site. And coal ash leaches heavy metals into the soil and water, for instance, lead and arsenic and cadmium and chromium. And while some is removed, the site still poses risk to Lake Michigan due to those rising levels and waves resulting from extreme weather. So if the waves have extreme um, are at extreme heights and turbulence, it can wash over under the shore and bring that residual coal ash back into the lake. And, and no one wants that. Um, similarly, at the US Steelworks in Gary, they um, have been operating an industrial facility on the lake shore. And it was identified by the US EPA as a large, gener large quantity generator of hazardous waste. And so with that, you get things like heavy metals and VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds, and PCBs, which you've probably heard about, and those are polychlorinated biphenyls, as well as mercury and dioxin. And so in 2019, there was flooding, again, due to extreme weather, and the facility released mercury into the Grand Calumet River. So Again, this is another example of the rising lake levels and high waves resulting from the extreme weather that present a risk to Lake Michigan. Illinois, um, <coughs> according to the report by ELPC, actually has some of the greatest risks of the four Lake Michigan states. So there is 63 miles of Lake Michigan shoreline in Illinois and the shoreline is densely populated. And if you've been there, you know it's interspersed with industrial areas along the shoreline as well as residential and, uh, and recreational areas. And these extreme lake levels and weather events also present serious challenges in Illinois. Um, some examples of those risks are a nuclear waste site, a coal plant, dredge dump, Superfund sites, as well as the densely populated communities along the shoreline. Specific examples are, the, are Zion's nuclear power plant. Now, while it was closed in 2010, highly radioactive spent nuclear waste remains there, and it is stored in concrete canisters near the, the shore. And the site is also surrounded by a fragile and eroding dune system. Similarly, in Waukegan, there are several industrial shoreline sites, and there's an old coal plant with coal ash ponds presenting the same risk that we saw in Indiana, as well as an aerospace coating facility and four Superfund sites. And then there are also risks to Chicago's north and south side neighborhood. So we experienced uh, within the last couple of years uh, significant flooding along with transportation infrastructure along the shore. And high water, according to the ELPC, could reach even further inland, uh, presenting risks to homes, businesses, medical facilities, and more. And then on the Chicago southeast side, you have three industrial sites along the Calumet River, again, that already pose pollution risks. And so again, this is another, these are other examples of how those higher water levels and extreme weather can exacerbate these challenges and flood those low lying communities nearby. Finally, in Wisconsin, there, these are a couple of examples. There's Two Rivers Wastewater Treatment Plant. And again, like the treatment plant in Michigan, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, it sits on a low-lying area, so it's surrounded by Lake Michigan and Two Rivers Harbors, and it is also vulnerable to flooding and extreme risks. And 
the high lake levels, the waves, they pose a risk because the facility is surrounded by water and you have erosion and sewage can contamination, which results in fecal coliforms and nitrogen and mercury emissions. So these levels can cause the overflows and wash out what are called primary and secondary clarifiers and aeration, aeration tanks, as well as exposed infrastructure, damage, machinery, electrical systems at the facility, which would interfere with sewage processing. And again, you have another wastewater treatment in Manitowoc, which is uh, a little further south of Two Rivers. Um, again, you can see from the list here, similar risks and threats experienced by two rivers. Uh, I will say on a, a happy note, um, we had our conference at, in Sheboygan River, uh, Sheboygan, Michigan, um, and that was an area of concern um, that the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding that we worked and advocate to keep that funding in place and receive in, increased funding that is an example of an area that has really been transformed by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and uh, reclaiming an area. And it is a perfect example of an industrial site that was turned into a beautiful resort and recreational area. Um, this is another example in Wisconsin. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but we could see the coal plant, the, the, the coal plant remains from Sheboygan Lakeshore. Um, and there are plans to fully retire that site by the end of 2022. And it, the Northern part of the property is on a bluff and the South portion is low lying. And then directly next to the lake are retaining walls for coal ash ponds. And so they are potentially vulnerable uh, to erosion and extreme weather. And ELP's research said that if water levels reach 589 feet above sea levels, those ponds could flood and potentially contaminate the lake and leach those heavy metals that we've talked about before uh, into the lake. So it does propose a risk to Lake Michigan due to the rising lake levels and waves. And um, the site also houses multiple online coal ash disposal areas, including four slag ponds and a one coal combustion residuals landfill. So the EPA has indicated that nearly all those ponds are poorly maintained. And the risks associated again with the stormwater and effluents from the fuel tank area, which joins uh, the river uh, present a problem. So those are specific examples of the risks and impact risks of climate change on Lake Michigan and what we're facing. Um, so in every part of the country, it has become apparent that our 20th century strategies for managing water no longer make sense in the face of climate change. And so the question is, what do we do? Well, if there are members of the public who are joining us, remember that if you're not already a member, join the League of Women Voters. And, and you are members of the League of Women Voters Lake Michigan region. If you're here from another league in, and your league is not a member, please join us. Um, and then sign up for the LWVUS Climate Change Google Group. We were talking a little bit about this in the meeting um, earlier, uh, but there are lots of folks who are really interested in climate change, both for water and other issues. And it's a great way to keep up on what's happening around the country and the world. And I would just say to you that um, the work we do is very inspirational, at least it is to me, because Nancy made reference to this before, but you know, everybody wants clean and safe water in which to recreate and water to drink and 
of course, Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River uh, in Illinois provides 98% of our drinking water. And of course, they're conduits for uh, commerce. And so it's so important that we preserve them. And when we are advocate, educating and advocacy and advocating for legislation, my experience and that of our organization is this is an issue in which you can truly get bipartisan support. People care about water. It's integral to our life. And it's really a place where we can find commonality and common interest in reach agreements. And the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, uh, which provides funding to reclaim sites throughout the, the Great Lakes area, uh, and Lake Michigan has been a tremendous uh, beneficiary of, of that funding, uh, is, has been consistently supported across the aisle. So while the previous administration had wanted to withdraw funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, that position did not stand. Members of Congress on both sides of the aisle wanted to preserve it. And so we not only kept that funding in place, but with the, the most recent Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, we obtained $1 billion in additional funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to be used over the next five years. And so that is a real accomplishment. And League of Women Voters like Michigan Region was involved in that advocacy initiative with our coalition partners and collaborators and signed on to letters that started at the uh, um, EOM office, the management and budget office, and then went to the subcommittee level, committee level, through Congress, all the way to passage, um, and, and pursued that in order to preserve and protect Lake Michigan. What can you do locally? And we really like to educate folks as to what they can do with regard to water and like Michigan's pr uh, protection and preservation at the local level. So ask your local legislators and candidates how they plan to use funds received from that bipartisan infrastructure bill. So with regard to water management, are they investing in gray infrastructure or green infrastructure? Gray being more concrete, bigger sewer pipes, or are they investing in green infrastructure where they focus on things like permeable pavers or native plants or creating an environment that more naturally takes care of managing water? And are they evaluating shoreline projects in light of climate change risks? Is that part of their planning for the future? Also, it's important to educate. So while we do a lot of education in this area, local leagues can too, and we encourage you to do so, and we will help you educate. So we are willing to give programs to your local league or to the community if you want to expand your reach that way. Um, this serves to educate local officials and community members uh, when you hold an educational event on 21st century approaches to water conservation or stormwater management. And we have a terrific group of people in our speakers bureau and some who are our stormwater management experts, if you will. And that is another water program that we could help you put together and either give you the resources so you can present it, or if you want someone from our Speakers Bureau, we're happy to do it. We have programs on rain gardens so that individuals can take steps to conserve and manage water. Um, and what you see in, uh, in the upper right corner of the screen is our, our um, water, I'm sorry, our watershed uh, 
model, which is an experiential uh, model where we can show you how water flows and the impacts of flooding and that sort of thing. And it's not only good for kids, but it's good for young people and adults as well to see and experience how this works. And some folks will, we circulate, we have two of these models and, and you can borrow them, but especially with uh, Fran on the board, we can arrange to get the model to you and you can take it to schools and we'll train you how to use it. Or if you want someone to come uh, demonstrate it, we might be able to make that happen as well. We also have many materials on growing native plants and uh, educating folks that native plants are nature's water treatment plants. Some of the reasons um, we have some trouble managing water is that we, we aren't making use of the plants that are native to the community that naturally um, contribute to stormwater management. And of course, advocate. So advocate for your local officials to pass and enforce building and permitting codes that encourage sustainability and water use conservation and management appropriate to your watershed. You know, some um, builders and folks, they want to do, they want to do green building. They want to have water efficiency and ventilation and building materials, but the, the codes that are present in the community just don't make that very easy. And so we wanna, this is something you can do lo locally by researching that and advocating um, in your community. And then finally, we like to say vote like the lake depends on it because we are the League of Voters. And in the end, it makes such a difference. Um, your voice, both locally, but when you go to the uh, ballot box. It's so important to research the issues and where your um, candidates stand on the environment and climate change. And so I will take questions, but I just want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for being a member of League of Women Voters Lake Michigan Region for your support and also for sending our way our wonderful Representative Fran Wallace. It's a delight to have her uh, on our board and, and she's really um, helped us with our state specific programming and other wonderful things. So thank you so much for uh, having me and I am going to stop sharing my screen so we can uh, talk a bit. Hey, we'll give everybody a second to get unmuted, turn on your cameras if you like, and bring on your questions for Joy. Okay, I'll, st I'll start. Can you hear me all right, Joy? I can. Um, Thank you so much for your presentation. You know, so this might be a, just an off the wall question, but as sea levels rise, are the Great Lakes in any danger from the St. Lawrence Seaway and the salt water that might come through that? You know, that's a good question. And I, I am not an expert on that, but it, it does illustrate a, poss a possible risk of, you know, the, the salt water intrusion into fresh water. Um, so I don't have the definitive answer on that. Um, but it's certainly something we're concerned about and certainly something that I could uh, find out. I'm so glad you asked that question because it really is something we should be considering. And, I know, uh, oh, the, the people in Florida, at least along the, especially along the Keys, because we were happened to just be there last week, are really worried about the salt water coming into their areas as the, the ocean rises. And of course, they get their drinking water from uh, their un from underground, and that's very porous with limestone, and so that's a concern they have down there. And it occurred to me to wonder if that's that could pot potentially be a problem, because it is going to rise. It is rising. Well, and you know, we are connected 
and and the St. Lawrence was really one of the ways uh, that um, invasive species uh, were introduced to the lakes. Um, right. I recommend to you a, a terrific book called The Life and Death of the, or Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan oh, yes. Egan. He talks a lot about those issues. So uh, that's a great question. And I, if I had to guess, and I, I wish that uh, David Mueller, our board member and advocacy chair were here. He is a real environmental expert and lawyer having practiced for decades in this area. Uh, I'd be interested in what he has to say, but I'll, I'll get that answer to you, Nancy. Oh, that would be good. Oh, Thank that you. Would be good. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I have a similar question along the same lines as Nancy's. As the oceans rise, and particularly because for us, the Arctic melting is going to cause the oceans to rise, is that going to cause the Great Lakes to rise as a direct result? Well, I, I think you already see that the Great Lakes are, are rising as a result of climate change. And, and the, the thing is, when you with this polar vortex and with the increased temperatures and then the trans evaporation that all of the water, uh, I mean, water bodies of water like the Great Lakes and the oceans are impacted by that. And so I, they are interconnected because the water system is a cohesive uh, whole, even though you have drought in areas, but these are areas that are typically drier than other areas of, of the country. <clears throat> uh, Joy, I'm, I have a question. Um, one of the <coughs> things that I find that, that, and I wonder what's your most effective way, when you're talking with people who are on the fence about being de deniers that the climate is changing and what the causes are, and they they all oh, here's comes the preacher, you know, they're coming to preach to me and tell me blah, 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 what I'm doing wrong. What have you found to be the most effective way to get into a decent discussion with people and have them really be able to look at things properly and what the reality really is? Um, you know, not waiting for them to get flooded out or something, you know. Right. I I that's a great question. And I really think education is the key. And one of the, I, I really hope that you'll go on our website and scroll down and look for the, our climate change forum that was held in April of this year. Tom Skilling, you know, he's a weatherman and right. he, he is beloved by many. And the wonderful thing about Tom is he's such an affable guy in person, he is as affable as he is on television. And people aren't really threatened by him, but he really addresses it through the science. And that was so important for him to bring together these scientists, um, Don Wobbles and Seth Darling. And Seth Darling is fantastic in terms of he is able to, like all good teachers, simplify complex issues with graphics and discussion and make it accessible to people. So I think having a, approaching it from the standpoint of science that's accessible to people um, is really important. Um, and events like this, um, we don't, you can tell by this, this climate change program we don't get super, super technical with people, but show them the things that are going on across the country and they're seeing them on the news. Um, and so I think that's a, a good way to approach it. And of course, like I said earlier, um, and I'm seeing something in the chat about finding common ground, water is common ground. Everyone yeah, more wants, common than water. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone wants clean water. They don't want too much water that they can't manage, but they want enough water and they don't want flooding that's going to contaminate their water. So I find that's a very easy access point for folks. Um, and you'll see examples 
you'll see a good example of education in that climate change forum. Uh, not from anything I did, but from the panel that, that Tom put together. Uh, I would also say that at the US level with this climate interest group, um, we have a lot of folks who have science backgrounds. And so we really try to make the information accessible, but based in fact, um, and that seems to make a difference. We have a question in the chat from Larry. Um, he asked, do you know if the EPA has a special task force that is focused on the Great Lakes? Well, the, the yes, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, has tremendous resources um, in the EPA. And so we had at our annual conference in October, uh, we had Heather Williams uh, and we'll be posting those um, programs, they're in post-production phase, but they will be posted probably within the next um, two to four weeks. And Heather was the project manager for the um, Sheboygan Area of Concern project. And so, yes, the answer, Larry, is that EPA has staff that, that implements Great Lake and oversees Great Lakes restoration projects. Um, and they, they do a great job on it. Um, and if you, if you watch that program, it was on the second day. So on the 22nd, the morning session, uh, you'll actually hear from an EPA project, an engineer project manager on how that was executed. And then you'll also see um, in the afternoon session, um, someone from the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration who is overseeing the newly designated um, marine sanctuary, which is just north of, um, of Sheboygan. Um, and that's also a project that um, is overseen by NOAA and the government to um, preserve and protect and, and use that marine sanctuary. There are a lot of shipwrecks in that area, but also in preserving and conserving that, they have implemented a lot of studies and scientific research that's helping in other aspects of preserving Lake Michigan. Well, myself. Could I, could I ask um, who, yes. who, who decides where the, uh, the money that from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, how, how that's spent? Is that the EPA that makes those decisions and how are they influenced? Like if, if, if uh, Illinois felt that that uh, coal ash plant in, in what, Gary or down there needed, needed to be cleaned up, would they would the senator or congressman advocate with EPA? Is yeah, that I, I think very often I I am not familiar with the intricacies of the application process, but I think a lot of it has to do with you know EPA does identify sites because they know if they've had sites that are problematic, but I think also the advocacy that folks do at a local level with their state reps and with their senators influences what has hap you know, is happening. And I just, if I can share my screen once more, um, I'm going to try to, um, Great Lakes Restoration. I'm going to try to pull up the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative site. If you'll bear with me one minute, if it's going to come up. If it's not, then we will abandon that. Um, this, I, I'm, I'm taking time to do this because. Um, we just I 
I'm going to try to share. Well, I don't know if I can share this right now. Okay, well, I'm going to direct you to glri.us. And maybe Miriam could pull that site up. And what's wonderful about this site is they have an interactive projects map. So if you go on that site, you're going to find, you'll be able to hover over um, the great different sites on the Great Lakes. There will be dots on there and you hover over those dots and you can actually click on to a site. So up in your neck of the woods, I click a dot and I see Research Lake Michigan Nearshore Ecosystem Changes. Um, and it shows you uh, the funding agency and the year it was developed and who's overseeing it, who received it, and the type of, was it non-point source pollution? So Miriam, if you'll put um, that link into the, the chat, people can go in there and see what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, if I'm recording the meeting, I cannot minimize my screen and pick up those links, but I promise that I will make sure that every link that uh, Joy has mentioned gets sent to this group in a follow-up so you can uh, check out the sites that she has mentioned. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Janice. Um, do you see the Great Lakes area as a refuge from climate change due to the fact that about 90% of the world's fresh water is here. Um, oh, sorry, 21% of the world's fresh water, 90% of the, the U.S.'s fresh water. Some seem to be promoting uh, this area as, as such. Okay, do I see it as a refuge? From uh, yeah, climate uh, change refuge. Yeah, uh, you know, there, there is a concern about climate refugees coming to the, the Great Lakes. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I know that I've read about people coming to the Great Lakes and of course it is, it is terrific, but the answer really is for us to nationally and globally reduce greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas emissions. We're not going to be able to serve the whole um, nation, um, but I certainly think we can can be an example of preservation, conservation, protection. Um, and I know that there, you know, sometimes someone presented in our climate change interest group at the national level, uh, an idea of diverting water from the Mississippi out to California. Well, that's just not gonna fly politically. I mean, that's, that's really not going to be something that people are on board with. So we do have to take mitigation and adaptation um, steps to address this, this issue. And I was, I was able to put that link in there, um, the GLRI link for you to access that interactive map. And it's on the home page that link. I, I do have another question because I've been worried about it and I know there's a Great Lakes Compact. Is that going to protect our uh, Great Lakes water from being sent out to Arizona and California and the Nevada? Yeah, I, I really, these diversion I think, all right, I'm not an expert, but I think these efforts to divert water outside the Great Lakes region are probably non-starters for political reasons. Okay. Um, could it happen? Maybe, but like I said, I think we really have to take a holistic approach um, to greenhouse gas emissions. And so even though we have these Great Lakes, it's still important for us to reduce our carbon footprint because what you do in Michigan or Illinois to reduce your carbon footprint actually has an impact globally. 
in terms of the impact of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, now, the compact has worked pretty well. However, um, we were we were took part in some litigation in Wisconsin because Wisconsin did violate the compact in allowing Foxconn water to be dis, uh, diverted from Lake Michigan to accommodate Foxconn. And that was supported uh, by um, the municipality that was diverting the funds. And then we engaged in litigation and we lost, we and our coalition partners lost that litigation. Um, and it's sort of a non-issue now because Foxconn was going to do a whole lot of work there and all these jobs and then it sort of fizzled out. But yes, we have to work hard to make sure that the participants in that compact honor the agreements they, they made. And uh, it's all tied up in politics too. You know, um, people who see themselves as conservationists and in supporting the environment. We found that some folks in that case from Wisconsin, they wanted those jobs. So they wanted the diversion to go forward. So, you know, there are competing interests that you have to balance in all of this. And, and that's why the advocacy is so important and the education. Are, th are there any other questions for Joy? I, I wanted to just ask one thing about uh, working with young people, working with elementary, high school students. What um, I see that you have some models for um, showing how things can look better, what, things that can actually make improve uh, water quality. Um, What's the best way and do you have suggestions on your site for how to approach the school children, how to help them understand what's happening and help them convey that message to their parents who will hopefully convey it to legislation and, and legislators? Well, there are a lot, that's a great question. And there are lots of ways you can do that. We've, our watershed model and our watershed game, um, which instructs about water management and conservation uh, and that sort of thing. We've had those circulate to summer programs in Waukegan Public Schools and then those teachers really were excited about it so they brought it into their regular curriculum. We've had the models and the games. We've had them circulate to um, community gatherings in the summer um, in, in public parks. So it really is something that you can do that's, that is not super time intensive. It's mainly logistically working out how to take advantage of these resources uh, and getting them to that venue. And, you know, we basically check them out to you and they've often stayed in one place for six to eight weeks while different uh, classes or summer camps take advantage of them. Yeah. My big concern when, when on, on any level, no matter what age group you're working with, for any trying to, trying to convince or change minds or have people have greater awareness that they always think you're going to preach to them. And so I think if we can do things that are more tactile to actually show an example of what's going on, those are the kinds of things that I've kind of been looking for to try to make it more real for people instead of just preaching to them. Absolutely. Um, you know, those experiential models and the games, they make it fun. Uh, the kids love pouring the water and seeing how it runs down and how it flows. Uh, the games, it's a game. So, so it is fun. And I, I uh, agree. And I hope I haven't sounded like I'm preaching, but I am the daughter of a preacher. So um, 
<laughs> you, you hear that tone. <laughs> I, I had a question. But I, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, a while ago, um, I think there was something, I'm not sure if it was a state, uh, st from the state level or from the U.S. level, recommending that local leaves uh, um, declare a climate emergency uh, as, as part of raising awareness about climate, climate change. And I was wondering if you had any insight about what the benefit would be to a local league taking steps like that. Well, um, you know, I would... It, the, at, at national, actually, that was a motion on the floor that passed at the national convention. And so it, and it's something that, you know, then you post on your website and you can communicate to people. And I think the purpose of it, um, why some folks really value this form of communication is it it makes people aware of the urgency that is necessary to address this issue. And, and it, is an, it is urgent, even though I'm very hopeful and I'm so delighted with the progress that we've made vis-a-vis -vis Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and all of the great things that have happened, not only in the the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, but the Inflation Reduction Act really has done a lot to put forward uh, funding and proposed initiatives that will reduce carbon emissions, um, but also make sense business-wise and economically. So it's, it's a great thing. Um, but some folks don't see the urgency to address these issues. And so I think these declarations are a way to make folks realize how important it is to league members. And the league is, is well respected. And because we're nonpartisan, um, the things we say matter and people take them seriously, I think. That's my opinion. That's my opinion too, and my hope. <laughs> if there are no more questions, um, I just want to thank. Are was there, there any, any questions? Anything's in the chat? I didn't know. I didn't look at the chat. So I have been watching the chat, and we are good to go. Okay. All right, all right then. Uh, we want to thank you so much for your time and your um, your views and your knowledge that you shared with us tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that, Joy. We really appreciate it. Well, and thank we you. Thank you for having us. We're, we were delighted.